and we'll get started. So good evening. My name is Onika Williams and I'm chair of the National Bar Association Young Lawyers Division. Welcome to the third installment of Pathways to Bar Leadership Roadshow featuring our very own YLD Trailblazer, National Bar Association Vice President, Lanita Baker. The National Bar Association was founded in 1925 and is the nation's oldest and largest national network of predominantly African-American attorneys and judges. The YLD is the home of the young lawyer within the NBA and represents the interests of young black attorneys under the age of 40 years old or originally admitted to practice within the past 10 years, whichever is more inclusive. This year, NBA YLD's theme, 2020 and Beyond, recognizing the importance of the young lawyer, will be seen throughout seven programmatic areas. One, election protection, voter registration and education. Two, COVID-19 recovery efforts. Three, efforts to eliminate police brutality. Four, 2020 census efforts now redistricting. Five, professional and skills development. Six, mental health and wellness. And seven, pipeline programs and mentorship opportunities. The Pathways to Bar Leadership Roadshow is one of the YLD's pipeline programs where YLD leadership interviews NBA or Big Bar leadership to learn their path to the legal field and their rise through NBA leadership. Tonight, YLD Vice Chair Carla Jordan Detmore will be serving as the interviewer. Carla is a senior associate of Vincent and Elkins and is a member of VNE's complex Commercial Litigation Practice Group. Carla is a past president of the Greater Washington Area of the Women's Lawyers Division of the NBA, GWAC, serving as president for the 2018-2019 term. Under her leadership, GWAC was selected as Voluntary Bar of the Year by the DC Bar. Lastly, among her many accolades, Carla is a 2020 recipient of the NBA's 40 Under 40 Nation's Best Advocate Award. And now, on to Carla and Vice President Baker. Hi everyone, uh, and I will forewarn you in advance, I have two dogs. I'm gonna try to mute when I'm not talking, but I apologize if they jump in. Uh, thank you so much, Onika, for such a lovely intro. And I will add both uh, Chair Onika Williams and Vice President Lenita Baker, also fellow NBA 40 Under 40 award recipient. So this program um, was really Onika's brainchild of wanting to expose our YLD members to the great people who are in leadership roles in the big bar and learn more about their path in the law, um, their path in the bar and how they became leaders and what they see as their future and also the, the development of their current career. So this is our third installment. Uh, we had two in the fall, one with President C.K. Hoffler and President-elect Carlos Moore. And now we have NBA Vice President Lenita Baker, who is the first person we've uh, interviewed so far who was actually a YLD member during this bar year. So we're super excited to have her here. Um, to tell you before we, we get going with the actual um, interview, fireside chat style, we want to give you a little bit of background about VP Baker. She is a lifelong Louisvillian. That's a word I've never had to say before. She graduated from Ballard High School and attended the University of Louisville on a full academic scholarship. And after obtaining a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and minors in Sociology and Pan-African Studies, she continued her studies at the University of Louisville Brandeis School of Law. In 2017, she also earned, excuse me, a master's degree in business administration with distinction from the University of Louisville College of Business. She is currently an attorney at Sam Aguiar Injury Lawyers in Louisville, Kentucky. And there she handles cases involving confidence, medical malpractice, defective products, and civil rights violations. Prior to working there, she served as an assistant Jefferson County attorney for over six years. And while she was in the Jefferson County Attorney's Office, she practiced in the Legislative Services Branch of the Civil Division and as a supervising prosecutor in the Criminal Division. Not only is she super busy with work, but she's super involved in the bar and she is the current president of the Charles W. Anderson Jr. Bar Association, formerly known as the Louisville Black Lawyers Association. 
serves as the vice president of the national um, vice president of the MBA for over regions and affiliates. She has served as the chief of communications for the MBA um, under the leadership of past president Ben Crump. And she's also served on the board of directors for the Louisville Bar Association and as an adjunct professor at the University of Louisville Brandeis School of Law. Um, now, she's received a lot of awards for her service over the years, including being named top 40 under 40 by the NBA in 2015, as well as the National Black Lawyers in 2017. And she's won three NBA presidential awards. Uh, 2019, she was awarded the Justice Award by the Louisville um, Urban League for her work in the Riley Reentry Project which helps provide ex expungement to deserving citizens in the Louisville community. And in 2020, she was recognized in the Louisville Business First 40 Under 40 program, which recognizes up and coming leaders in the area. Um, in addition to that, many of you already know, uh, she is the family attorney for the family of Breonna Taylor. So we're gonna talk about that some today. And she is also a mother. She's a proud member of Alpha Kappa Alpha. And she has her own blog, The Diva Attorney. So um, the way this works is we're going to talk to VP Baker about, you know, her experience and um, professional growth, as well as her journey in the MBA and her current work. You all are free to put questions. You can put it in the, the chat box on the right. Um, and we'll address throughout. This is super casual. So whenever you have something that you want to know about, feel free to um, put it in the box. So we're going to start out. You could tell us um, a little bit about your background and what made you decide you wanted to be a lawyer in the first place. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair uh, Carla. I became, I, well, I decided to go to law school after starting undergraduate as a physical therapy major. Um, I was a physical therapy major because I wanted to do sports medicine, um, but then I got to my second semester, second level biology course and realized sciences just were not my thing. And so physical therapy and the rest of biology, anatomy, everything else that I would have had to take um, was not in the courts for me. Um, as a child, I had always wanted to be a lawyer, but I let people steer me away from that path because it's like, oh, there's too many lawyers. It'd be hard to find a job. You don't want to do that. Um, but um, so I at one point was going to be a teacher. But as I said, I started undergraduate as a physical therapy um, major. After I switched, I decided, hey, I'm going to do law school. No one's going to talk me out of it. Um, I majored in psychology, which you would think is still more sciences, but I, it was very interesting in just learning how uh, the mind works. But at that point, um, someone had told me, like, just major in what you get good grades in uh, and make sure that you like the subject, because if you're going to go to law school, you can pretty much get a, a bachelor's in anything. Um, and so that's why I picked psychology and then minored in sociology and Pan-African studies, because I really was uh, interested in the social sciences. Um, so I, once I knew I was going to go to law school, which again was during my freshman year of undergrad, I began to go ahead and study early for the LSAT when I could in between classes. Um, I had my child when I was 15 years old. So uh, it was one of those things where I really didn't have the luxury of um, playing around in undergraduate um, and even high school. I was a, a freshman in high school when I had my daughter. So um, I just sat down, did it. I, I finished undergraduate in four years. I took my LSAT uh, during the spring of my junior year, just in case I needed to retake it in my senior year. Uh, luckily I did well enough um, my freshman or my first time taking it in that junior year that I didn't have to retake it. Um, I applied for several law schools and was accepted to law schools outside of the state, but I stayed home uh, because my support system was here. Uh, just thinking of how hard it would be to be a single mom in law school. Um, I didn't want to put myself in that type of predicament. So my family, my support system was very strong, stayed here, went to University of Louisville, um, graduated in 2006. The one thing that I keep saying, I, I, left, I left it out of my bio and I need to re-add it is, I began my legal career as a public defender Mm -hmm. uh, and then went into private uh, criminal defense before I became a prosecutor. Um, 
we can talk about, I can go ahead and talk about why I switched from defense to prosecutorial now, or if you want that to come up later. No, you can talk about it now. Yeah. Okay. So um, I always get asked the question because most people do it the opposite way, right? They become mm -hmm. a prosecutor and then defense attorney. So people always ask, you know, why did you switch to prosecuting after being a defense attorney? And it was because I felt like I could have more impact on my communities as a prosecutor. Uh, one, as a defense attorney, you know, my job was not necessarily uh, to do what's in the best interest of my client, but it was to get the best legal outcome for my client. Um, so that could be, and when I say that, and the difference being is if you, if I knew my client was, had a drug uh, addiction, I still wanted to do everything that I could to get their case dismissed if I could, you know, if I could, or, you know, even if they pled or were found guilty I, in seeking probation, I would try not to get them to have to go to rehab because that's just one more thing that they could mess up while they're on probation that could possibly send them to jail. So I would never want that um, predicament of trying to get extra conditions put on my client. Uh, and I had one too many clients just either get out, die of an overdose, um, get out, continue to, you know, come back into the system. Um, and so I became a prosecutor because I felt like if I prosecuted with the, the right mindset of effectuating justice, that I could have more of an impact. So I prosecuted from the angle of what services or what um, resources can I get to people to, you know, who are in front of me, who are defendants um, to possibly uh, to do what I can to prevent them from coming back into the court system. Uh, so. I could force drug treatment on people or try to for it. Of course, if, if the case wasn't, if police didn't do their job right, that's one thing, but you know, I, I, could, I could push drug treatment. I could push different uh, job training programs um, to get people to quit stealing. You know, for instance, you know, if they get a job, they don't have to steal to provide for their families. So I, all of those social sciences that I've majored in undergraduate, just I was, I'm still kind of a social worker as a lawyer. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to change the world. So. How, how do you think those experiences, both having been a defense attorney and a prosecutor, have helped shape your current practice and in, in private practice? Yeah, um, that especially with my civil rights practice, um, which makes up a small percentage of our legal practice, um, actually. But with the civil rights practice, I know when uh, I know I'm familiar with LMPD. So Louisville Metro Police Department policies and procedures, uh, the criminal law background, the search and seizure rules. So I, I have more of a understanding of when um, things are not done correctly and when people's rights are violated. Um, and so drawing on both of the experiences, both as a defense attorney and as a prosecutor, I'm able to use that in my civil rights practice. I also have a lot of relationships, especially um, from being a prosecutor, you'd be amazed at, you know, the number, well, you, we always see how thick the blue line is to protect officers um, who've been in trouble. You'd be amazed at the number um, of officers who will contact you, you know, behind the scenes and kind of give you a um, idea of, hey, you should look into this or you should request this. Um, there are a lot out there because of the relationships that I had previously built uh, with officers while serving as a, a both criminal defense and prosecutorial attorney. Um, so I think that definitely helps. How did, how did you end up incorporating your civil rights work into your practice? You said earlier for the firm as a whole, it's actually a pretty small part of the practice area. So let me think. Well, one, when I went to Sam Aguiar, he was already an attorney who was practicing uh, he would pick up civil rights cases um, throughout the year. So um, he actually graduated law school after me, but one of his early cases uh, that he had some uh, success with was a uh, police chase um, that resulted in four teenagers dying and he represented one of the teenagers. Uh, and so once he got in uh, to a case with Louisville Metro Police Department, he, um, you know, you learn to work those cases. He could, people would begin to come to him. Um, mine, the first one that I signed myself was actually someone that I know uh, who um, used to be, uh, his mom used to be an investigator 
at the public defender's office when I worked there and it's Tayon Lee, uh, which uh, some of you may have heard about his case, but it was just a couple of years ago. He was the 18, and his, his, the video of his police stop went viral, but he was an 18 year old who was pulled over for absolutely no reason pulled out of his car, handcuffed. Uh, his car was searched for you know, 45 minutes to uh, an hour while he's handcuffed on the side of the road uh, while they looked for drugs and there were none because uh, Tayon did not participate in any illegal activity. And what we learned is that the Louisville Metro Police Department was employing a tactic called, they called people, places, narcotics. So basically they had sanctioned um, racial profiling. We're going to pull over young black men driving nice cars in impoverished neighborhoods because that's indicative of drug trafficking. Um, and, and that's what they were doing. And so I just felt very strongly about that case, about what happened to him. And, um, wanted, and I signed the case up because I felt like we could stop that practice. We needed to stop that practice. Um, and it wasn't right. And even from going back to my time as a prosecutor, you know, I, Tayan, I hate to, to, to make the comparison because he does not engage in any illegal activity, but let's just say that they did uncover a trunk full of guns and drugs. It would have been thrown out because they had no right to even pull him over, let alone search him. So when we're talking about we want to make our community safer, just over policing our neighborhoods are not going to do that. Um, and so that was the first case. And then once you, and that case was viral. And so it made a lot of and news stations locally. And so once people start to see you um, engaged in those cases, uh, they do reach out more. So I, people always ask, how do I figure out which civil rights cases that I'm gonna mm -hmm. take? And I, all I can tell people is it's a gut instinct because there's so many people that call, but you can't take all of them. Like there's no way that anyone could do a significant number of civil rights cases at any given time um, because they are very labor intensive. Do you uh, have a preference generally about, you know, uh, cases related to warrants versus cases related to illegal stops or, you know, ha has your caseload over the years tended in a certain direction? No, I, I mean, I really do. It, it's that gut feeling like with Brianna Taylor's case, it was, you know, when I met with her mom. Um, so Brianna was killed March 13th, which, you know, we go back. And if you think about that, that was at the very beginning of COVID. Um, and we had just begun to work remotely from home. I'm sitting at home on that Friday watching the news and I see, you know, the news story of um, police officer shot one suspect dead, one suspect in custody. I didn't think much about it um, at that time because I'm like, oh, an officer was shot. Um, well, then the next day that Saturday, I get a call um, saying that, you know, um, the young woman who was killed by police the day before, her family wanted to meet with me. And so I set up a meeting and when I met with them, again, it was just that instinct that, and that gut feeling that something went wrong when they executed this search warrant. Um, and I wanted to get to the bottom of it. So it's just kind of, you know, um, maybe it was the fact that it was in her home, the sanctity of her own home, um, whether it was the search warrant was bad, um, whether it was the trying to tie uh, a black woman um, to illegal activities simply because of someone she dated in the past. That's something that I always knew from the beginning of the case. Her, her family was not, um, you know, they did not try to hide that from us. But in saying that, she was no longer dealing with that individual. But that's how, you know, police tied her to this whole investigation is from a, a relationship that she had ended months prior. And so it really was just, with that case, so many things went wrong that should not have happened, um, that it could be any of us in that situation. It could, and I have a daughter who's only, you know, two years younger than Brianna was when Brianna was killed. And all I could think of, like, that could have been my child, uh, just wrong place, wrong time. Um, and so it's just, so I don't necessarily have, whether it's the stops, the search, search and seizure, whether it's the shootings, um, I have an um, inmate case where correction officers attacked an inmate and then tried to charge him. Um, it's just the what if, if, a case, if I meet with someone and the case really pisses me off, I'm like, OK, I'm signing it up and I'm ready to take them on. So. Now, I know you worked under Ben Crump when he was president of the NBA. 
How does your experience with the MBA and some of the, the fellow people in the MBA who do this type of civil rights work influence your own career path? Yeah. So one thing I always tell people is, um, you know, Sam and I assigned Brianna's case up, as I said, you know, within days of Brianna being killed, we tried our best to get people to pay attention to the case uh, for months and we couldn't get in, not even local news um, stations to pick it up. So, you know, I had, I reached out to Ben Crump because of my past relationship with Ben, uh, uh, with ben Crump. Um, and especially because the, um, when I reached out to him, it was right, right as uh, Ahmaud Arbery's story was taken off. And so I was like, well, you know, let me reach out to Ben and see if he wants to come in and uh, join us on this case. And without hesitation, um, he came in, um, you know, he talked, well, talked to mom, um, Brianna's mom, uh, talked to Sam, uh, and, and within days of him joining the case, you know, the world knew about what happened to Brianna Taylor. And so I'm blessed to have those relationships within the NBA to call on people like that. Um, you know, I have, a, I'm co-counsel with President C.K. Hoffler on a medical negligence case. Um, it's probably my last medical negligence case, but you know, when I, <laughs> when I switched to um, doing plaintiff's work, no one in my office did medical negligence. Well, I wanted to try one because I'm like, you know, why not? Um, she is one of the most well-respected um, trial attorneys out there, especially as it relates to medical negligence. And I intentionally wanted to um, reach out to her because she is a black female uh, who is very well respected because until that point, I'd never really had um, that black female trial attorney that was just a beast in all ways you can think of um, that I, I felt comfortable enough going to, but I reached out to her, you know, she asked to, me to send her the medical records. She sent her, sent the medical records off to her expert. And after she did everything she needed to do to decide if she wanted to join the case, she said, I would be honored. And um, one thing I loved about it, like we were in, I'm, I was, all, you know, I've always been trained to be that meek mouth, da, da, da. And like, we were in a deposition and like President Hoffler is a force to be reckoned with. And so uh, seeing her in action, I'm like, wow, like it gives you that extra push. Uh, so that's one of the things I love about the NBA and being around NBA attorneys and especially as a black female, because sometimes we, I think we do tend to temper our uh, responses or how we may appear in court because we don't want to be seen as angry or sassy or da da da. But when I say I saw her in action, I was like, oh, I can. Do hey, okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, she it, it was just you know, and, and the other the opposing counsel will put on notice. Oh, she's not to be messed with. So let me know that it's okay. Let them know. I can be, and, and I'm not, and when I say that she wasn't angry, she wasn't, but you know, it was just, she mm -hmm. was very much more assertive than I typically am. And so to see that it was okay to do that just gave me that extra sense of confidence as a black female attorney. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're very lucky to have a, a black woman who is leading our organization right now. Um, we've had lots of great black women presidents of the MBA, and I hope we continue to have more. Mm -hmm. um, I, as I know, a, a young black woman lawyer, don't see a ton of black women, especially in litigation, who are in high profile positions or who are on the news. Um, and I know the work that you all do inspires me. So thank you. Thank you. What, what, what do you see it beyond just like your individual relationships with Ben um, and President Hoffler? What do you see as the, the MBA as an organization's role in this civil rights movement? Uh, I definitely think it's necessary for the National Bar Association to remain at the forefront of um, the civil rights movement. I mean, we go back to Fred Gray of, of all people who represented the families of Rosa Parks or not the family, who represented Rosa Parks and, and Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, he's portrayed in Selma by Cuba Gooding Jr. Uh, so we have always been at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And I think that it's necessary for black attorneys to remain at the forefront of um, these battles because we understand it more than anyone else, what truly is 
happening to our people, whether it be through people that we know, whether it be friends, whether it be family, like there's not a lot of things that occur that we can't say we know someone that's been touched by um, something similar. And so um, I think it's necessary um, that we stay involved. I think that um, we've done a very good job of, of making sure that uh, we are relevant in those fights. Uh, I think that one thing I would like to see is that when we, um, as an organization each year, we, we set our legislative agendas. I would like to see more of those legislative agendas uh, sp spread throughout the affiliate chapters. And I say that because uh, we're always in you know, Washington DC um, lobbying on a federal level but we all know that, especially when it comes to criminal justice and, and many civil rights laws, they're controlled at a state level. So if we can give those tools to our affiliate chapters to go into their state legislators um, and push for legislation, um, I think we'd be that much stronger and it would be, we would be able to put our imprint on the world that, you know, even that much more. So that's one thing that I would really like to see us employ as we continue to fight social justice. And to give an example of when I say that, like, uh, we passed um, Brianna's law, you know, on a local level. Virginia just passed Brianna's law um, as well, which and Brianna's law for the most part in when states are doing it, is to ban no knock warrants um, because of how dangerous they are. Uh, so I would like to see that done in all 50 states. Yes, Rand Paul has um, instituted has, has introduced Brianna's Justice for Brianna Taylor Act uh, on the federal level, which would affect funding. Uh, should uh, should police departments not um, um, ban no knock warrants, but at the end of the day, they can't stop police departments from instituting no knock warrants. Only that can only be done from a state level. Um, so that's what I would like to see us do in the future. And I think it would also help with recruiting um, if lawyers start to see us having an impact on that local level. I think it would be uh, very strong. So now you mentioned Brianna's law and the, the issue with no knock warrants. Are there other uh, particular reforms that you would like to see that you've seen in your career in civil rights of changes that you think would be really helpful at the, the legislative level? I think the Justice for George Floyd Act um, currently pending uh, in the federal government is also very important. That would, um, the, the parts of that that I think are very important are the ones that chip away at the qualified immunity um, statute or, you know, laws governing police. Um, officers we know are able to get away with so much, so many things because of their qualified immunity. So I think if we can begin to chip away at that um, and we can do that if that law is, if that act is passed, um, I think it'd be a huge impact on civil rights. Yeah, so, so one of the things that I know is particularly frustrating um, from the perspective of people in, in private practice is, you know, we aren't the prosecutors anymore. And so, you know, there are certain things that we don't have control over in the, the criminal justice system. Um, but I know, for example, you were able to reach a historic, historic settlement uh, with the city of Louisville in Brianna's case. Could you talk a little bit more about like the types um, of reforms that you were able to establish through that settlement and ways that you see um, people in private practice being able to help um, make advancements in the civil rights movement? Yeah, uh, so some of the things that we um, that were very important to us in the reform package for Breonna Taylor settlement, uh, which went along with the financial settlement. Um, first, uh, her mom would like for her, the money was not an issue like she could care less about how much money she got because it, none of it was going to bring her mother I mean her daughter back but what she wanted to make sure she did is try to do what she could to prevent what happened to Brianna from happening to anyone else um, so some of the legislation we um, or some of the policies that we were able to get passed were uh, dealing with accountability um, well and we kind of listened to um, different activists and protesters and just the community and things that they wanted to see. So I always say we broke it down into a few things. So one was kind of community policing, um, give officers an incentive to live within the communities uh, in which they police. Of course, you know, you can't require them to live somewhere, but if you can get incentivize them to live within the communities they police, because 
um, a majority of the officers in Louisville Metro Police Department do not live in Louisville, even though it's the biggest city in the state, they live on the outskirts. Um, so require you or give them an incentive to actually live so that you know who your police and things like that. Uh, if you don't want to live in your community, then uh, they uh, what the city also agreed to do is give officers uh, so many hours off per week to volunteer within their communities uh, that they police. So if they're, you know, if they work in the eighth district, they had to volunteer in the eighth, uh, eighth district. So you know, you can't just you're not just going to be able to you know, coach your son's little league football team, but let's go to the uh, neighborhood where you're policing individuals and, and go volunteer you know, as a coach there so that you get to know these kids and they get to know you and they feel comfortable around you. So that the first time that you all are interacting, is it in a um, authoritarian position, if that makes sense? So that was one uh, section of the reform. The other was accountability. What was happening here is Alpha, the, the department was, if they didn't find um, violations, like uh, upon complaint, like when co complaints were filed, if they didn't substantiate the violations, they would just throw away the, the violations. So you're not seeing that there's a pattern. So, you know, one dismiss uh, complaint may be one thing, but if they have six of the same thing, but you don't know about it because you keep um, throwing it away, then there's not much you know, you don't, you never get to see the pattern. So um, we said whether they are substantiated or not, they needed to retain all citizen complaints and all um, PSU investigations. Um, we created the um, office of the inspector general so that the person doing these in, uh, investigations are not employees of um, Louisville Metro Police Department, our hope is that there is not anyone that ever worked within Louisville Metro Police Department. They haven't hired that person. But, you know, it's one thing when you're coming up and being investigated within a department, but you're being investigated by people who maybe were once your beat partners. How does that work? You know, is it is it ever going to be fair? Is it ever going to be, you know, an unbiased uh, outcome? So that was uh, some of the reform that we were able to get through. Um, and then also um, they would close investigations by exception if the person just resigned. So um, someone who made like here, we had a really big um, sex abuse scandal with the Explorers program. So you know how uh, police departments have their um, cadet programs. So officers were accused of sexually abusing the kids that were in this program. They began an investigation, but when they resigned, they closed the investigation by exception. Well, what happened is that doesn't, since it, they resigned and there's no substantiated findings, that doesn't prevent them from going to get a job with another department, which is what they did until eventually they were criminally charged. But uh, if, it's an, if it's a violation that would substantiate criminal charges, that does um, impact something that you have no business being a police officer. We need you to conclude that investigation and note the foul that had this person not resigned, they would have been terminated for such and such reason. So hopefully that prevents them from getting hired to another department. Now, of course, I'm definitely in favor of tracking police officers so that they can't just go from department to department causing um, craziness. That makes sense. Definitely. Sorry, we got a bit of come on. Oh, no, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> you're good. What um you talked some about wishing that the the MBA would um on in terms of the legislative agenda and working with the local chapters. I know you are the the president of the local uh, Black Lawyers Association in Louisville. What kinds of things have you been able to do through your local bar to affect this kind of change? That's another part of my resume that I have to, or my bio that I have to update. I'm finally, I'm the immediate past president now. That's a good um, feeling. <laughs> I know. Um, but no, so some of the things that we've done um, locally is uh, we had attorneys volunteer to represent protesters um, pro bono. And I think that's one of those things that, um, you know, people always wonder like, I, what can I do um, when there's so many, like, we had a lot of people arrested for protesting throughout the summer and even through the fall. Um, and so there's enough criminal defense attorneys who were serving pro bono that they could actually help train 
um, people who don't necessarily practice in criminal law. Um, but we also luckily have a lot of members who have been former prosecutors um, and also serve as criminal defense attorneys that we volunteer, you know, to serve, um, to represent individuals pro bono. So even while I was representing Brianna Taylor's case, like I actually had court this morning representing um, people who were arrested while protesting um, the, whether at Daniel Cameron's house, whether it was, you know, just getting in good trouble blocking traffic. Uh, and so um, it's really been um, a good experience and a feel good thing. Like I don't, the, the, I stay connected with the community, the community, um, has their trust in us. And I think that, again, that's one of those things where I didn't want to see only white attorneys stepping up to represent our people pro bono. So um, it was it, it was relatively easy to get people to agree to do that. In addition, we've also uh, held Know Your Rights um, panels. We've done some um, election protection, um, you know, under the direction of President Hoffler, some election protection seminars. Uh, so we've been really busy in making sure we we um, held our own march, um, which was was pretty good to see, you know, just this large group of black attorneys um, march from, you know, march a few blocks to where um, the protesters had occupied. So they occupied across from the courthouse. So we walked to that space um, to be with the community. And it was just a powerful sighting to see that because a lot of times we're like, how many black attorneys do we even have in Louisville? And you're like, we're here, we're here. So to see us at one time, I think was very powerful. Yeah, I, I also feel like with, um, you know, incidents going viral these days and having a lot more um, exposure in the media, we see at least the past year, we've seen, I think, more engagement by folks that don't just look like us. Um, yeah. We've seen a lot of, uh, I think, to me, it makes me very happy, a lot of young people who seem very engaged um, and, and not just members of the African American community. What, what do you think we can do to continue keeping the engagement of people who are not Black about caring about the issues that we face in the black community, especially around policing? Um, it's hard. Like right now, I think you're right. They are, I hate that when that happens. Um, right now they are very engaged um, because the cases have been very publicized uh, and people see. And I think that um, partly that the person that was occupying the White House before January 20th, I refuse to say that name, um, they brought out and, and exposed so much um, of the volatile behavior of people, the, the racism that is pervading our country, that people actually got to see it firsthand as opposed to us saying it or, you know, it's not, it is, they can no longer say, oh, we're just complaining or we're imagining. There are still some people that say that, but they're just crazy, right? Um, but they can't just say that we're imagining that things are, are as bad as they are. Uh, I do think that um, the big thing with civil rights, like civil rights is not new. It's just now becoming uh, sensationalized. And I don't think it necessarily, the media has no choice but to pay attention when things like, um, George Floyd's murder on captured on camera uh, starts to pervade social media. Mm -hmm. Like the media would be crazy to ignore um, something like that, you know, as they begin to, because that's usually what happens is it goes viral on social media and then the um, media picks it up. Um, so we're seeing so many things, we're cap capturing so many things. And so I know so many people, um, you know, you get torn because like you don't like all of the cameras being everywhere on street poles and things like that. But without video cameras, without yeah. video yeah. footage, we wouldn't have the evidence and it would we would still be living in a time where it's, you know, a suspect's word versus the officer's word and more people were are more apt to believe the officer's word. Well, now we're seeing, you know, where officers are being caught in flat out lies. You know, in Breonna Taylor's case, it's the the whole thing with the the confirming with the postal inspector that she was supposedly receiving illegal drugs. And the postal inspector's like, oh no, I never told anyone that. So, you know, we are really being able to highlight that officers just not are just not as truthful 
as they say they are, whether it's, you know, they're caught in a lie because of video evidence or just people are just willing to come forward because it, it's just not right. And I think people, more people than not are uh, wanting to do the right thing. They're want, they want to be good people. And so when they see something like that, they're more apt to, to speak up. And, and I, I just can't help but think about, especially with all the publicity, um, the amount of information we've seen about what's happened in the grand jury proceedings. Um, I think that's something that we don't, we don't normally as public see what, you know, yeah. what prosecutors are actually presenting as evidence. Um, and I think that's, that's part of what's making people very, I know it makes me very angry and frustrated. Um, I saw yesterday, the day before, some of the, the grand jurors have now filed a lawsuit to impeach um, the AG. Do you have any sense of whether there's support for that or other things that, that people in the community are um, advocating for to figure out how to improve the, the grand jury process? Process. Um, definitely, I think one thing that, and that a lot of the pushing for the grand jury um, transcripts, um, I can't, I never reached out to any grand jurors to come forward, but once they started to be like, hey, we want to come forward, you're like, get an attorney, talk to an attorney, mm -hmm. like, um, and so I was very happy at the way that um, the transcript was released and the grand jurors were um, permitted to uh, talk because um, we were able to see that Daniel Cameron just did not uphold his responsibilities as a prosecutor, um, and we've been able to call him out on that. Um, now, whether and, and the same grand jurors that have come forward are the ones that uh, initiated the petition to impeach Daniel Cameron. Um, I don't know how that petition is going to go. I know that we're continuing to fight um, the legal battle of trying to get him just plain out removed from the case because he's shown that he won't. So we're doing that through the court process. Um, the thing that I was scared about with the impeachment thing is that what I don't want to happen is for it to be this political battle of Republicans, Democrats, because um, prior to um, the grand jurors filing one against Daniel Cameron, there were citizens who filed one against our Democratic governor because of all the COVID restrictions. And so it was all, and so we did, we had people from the Kentucky Democratic Party reach out and say, hey, would you guys get behind this? And I was like, not if it's a political ploy, you know, but do I think Daniel Cameron deserves to be impeached? Absolutely. Um, do I think he deserves to be punished by the, the Bar Association? Absolutely, because he didn't uphold his responsibilities as a prosecutor. Um, and anyone else that I think, uh, anyone else, and, and there's things you can say, you know, prosecutorial discretion, this or that. He flat out lied to America, like just flat out lied. Um, and also just under, our, he did not follow the Kentucky rules of criminal procedure when he was presenting to the grand jury and when they asked for. So it's not a prosecutorial discretion thing. It's a, he chose not to uphold his responsibilities. So. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> we have uh, one, so we're, we're getting near the end. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, and we did have a, a question in the chat. So I wanted to make sure we got that. Um, Alicia asked, how did your MBA membership impact your early career decisions? Um, so later on in my decision, I became active in the MBA after um, I became a prosecutor. Um, and so, but even then, like I started as a, a criminal prosecutor, the meeting people in the MBA, like that gave me the courage, like the office that I worked for allowed me to move to the civil side and advise um, Metro Council, so our city um, legislative arm. I never would have even known about that practice area without coming to the MBA and getting to meet people who were in that or, or just the, um, again, confidence to try something different. Um, and definitely when I switched to doing civil work, um, you know, you get to the MBA, you go to the CLEs, um, you see the powerful trial attorneys that we have. And I'm like, I can do that. Um, and so um, that, that, that is one of the things that uh, led me. And I also will say that my MBA membership, um, being 
chief of communications to um, Ben, that actually, um, Sam had saw some of the things that I would write for Ben. Um, and we were, I was writing a lot of articles and, and things uh, when Ben was president because he was so widely, um, as he still is, that people wanted to hear from him um, whenever anything uh, police related happened. Um, so uh, I, was, I was busy writing. Uh, and Sam saw some of the stuff that I would write for him. And um, so we had a conversation about that. And so it, it was kind of that, hmm, let's try, see if I can do this civil thing. And I like it. I will say I've never had a legal job that I've not liked, which is, I, you know, I don't know what that means. Like I, maybe I'll go do corporate in five That's years. Very like, I like corporate too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I have been fortunate in that aspect that I, I've not had a legal uh, job that I've not enjoyed. Yeah, so I, you know, as the YLD, we have some of the the newest members to the legal profession. I know I actually see a couple of uh, people on here who are first year associates at my firm who started last week. Um, what advice do you have for um, the young people in terms of uh, taking advantage of the MBA? I definitely think that that's the one thing I wish I had done that I didn't do was get involved in the National Bar Association earlier. Um, because the network that you have, um, the mentors that you have access to, um, being able to learn about the different practice areas, uh, the MBA is 100% worth, like you get the return on your investment year in, year out. Um, and it's like, the first time I came to a convention, I looked around and I was like, oh my, I thought I was in heaven. Like, um, <laughs> You don't I did see that like black so many, lawyers in regular everyday life. Exactly. So I was in heaven at my first MBA convention, and I've been hooked ever since. So like I'm that person that goes like, oh, like I I kind of sad in this virtual world because I always look forward to um, meeting new attorneys, getting to see my friends again at the different. Uh, the various different meetings throughout the year. I, I've gone to the employment law conference and I've never <laughs> practiced employment law a day in my life, but I went, I had fun. Um, and I thought about like, well, maybe I can take an employment law case, but you know. <laughs> and so you are, you're currently vice president in the MBA. Um, we have a lot of really young leadership on the executive board this year, which is awesome. What do you see for your future in the MBA? And, so and I was I, and this with when we prepared, I didn't yet know you were running for anything. So it's not that an is all right, or anything. Yeah. This is a general question about your involvement in the MBA. Yes. So I will start, but I will go back to, I first joined the Board of Governors as an affiliate chapter representative. Uh, so I was my affiliate chapter president. Um, the board has several slots for affiliate chapter presidents. That was when, um, past president Pam Means uh, was in charge, was leading the organization. Um, and I really enjoyed, um, like, like I took that role serious. Um, Rosinia Cummings out of California was the VP of Regions and Affiliates. So we kind of um, were directed to work under her and just being able to, I, I took so much from the NBA back to my affiliate chapter that it made my affiliate chapter that much stronger. Um, and so that's one of the things I enjoyed about um, serving early on as an affiliate chapter representative. Now I came into the National Bar Association being very active on a regional level. Um, we were asked to, my chapter was asked to host a region meeting. So I'm in region six. We rotate between Kentucky, Tennessee, Ohio, and Michigan. And so I'll go back, we were not asked, but one of um, our state Senator, Gerald Neal, he's a past president, I mean, a past vice president for the National Bar Association. Someone reached out to him and asked him if we were hosting. He's like, yeah. And then he calls the officers to say, hey, I volunteered us to, to host the Region 6 meeting. I'm like, do what? Um, but my region, region 6, my region is very close knit. I love it. Um, again, that's how I came into the National Bar Association. Um, and then after being connected with uh, my regional members, someone reached out and was like, hey, they need an extra affiliate representative on the board. Will you do it? I did not know what I was signing up for, but I was like, sure, because I was having so much fun on the regional level. So I was like, sure. 
Um, so joined the Board of Governors. I did that for two years, affiliate chapter representative for two years. Then I became Region 6 director for a year. And then board member at large, I did for three years because the first time I um, filled it unexpired term. So I did three years and then ran for vice president. And now, and I, so that was a two year term. It ends this summer and I am running to become president elect of the National Bar Association. I've enjoyed it so much so. Um, but I've also served chief of staff under Joe Drayton. So um, one thing, many of us who have served the NBA know that it is work. Um, and, it, but if you're willing to put in the work, the reward is so great, so, you know. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly endorse that. When I was GWAC's president, I was a, a affiliate chapter rep on the board. I know Alicia McNeil, who's on as well, also served as an affiliate rep uh, when she was GWAC president. And uh, current vice president, Henry Floyd, who was on earlier, was also an affiliate rep when he was the president of the Washington Bar, or when he was president-elect of the Washington Bar. So I, I think it's a really great opportunity to uh, start to get to know the inner workings of the organization and procedure and structural and, you know, uh, priorities of the organization. So I see Kevin has his hand raised. He was also typing. I don't, Onika, I don't know how to work um, the hand raised situation. So he uh, mm -hmm. wanted to give you a shout out, um, Madam Vice President. He said you were great. I want to thank Vice President Baker for her service to the MBA, law students, and especially her unwavering support of me. So uh, Kevin Jones is the immediate past chair of the law students division and one of our newest YLD members. And yes. So, um, he wanted to, to shout you out. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Um, I did have one last question and then we'll, we will um, wrap up. I did see um, Vice President Henry Floyd. I see um, Ben F. Jones President Quentin Thompson. Um, I saw some Vincent and Elkins associates. I saw your Vice President from your local chapter, Alicia Ockard. Um, I see Roger Johnson from Virgil Hawkins. If I forgot anyone, I'm so sorry. I've been trying to monitor as you've come in. But um, so you may know um, the National Bar Association Young Lawyers Division, we are on a quest to create a National Young Lawyers Week. And we are actually um, doing it through the American Bar Association Young Lawyers Division resolutions process. And okay. in the resolution, we actually use you as an example Fred Gray, um, just as an example of what young lawyers can do, especially in our affiliate, in our um, bar association where young lawyers can be up to 40 or less than 10 years of work experience. Um, you touched on this earlier. I know it's probably very confusing for current law students with everything that's going on um, between what you mentioned with um, um, Attorney General Cameron and just like all of what happened during the election, ethics class must be like crazy right now. And I just wanted <laughs> to know your thoughts on that. And, and as a young lawyer, because there is so much going on and it is, it's kind of hard to tell, like, is that appropriate or not? Because we aren't sure anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, one, we know um, when we look at something, we kind of know when, when it's not right, right? Um, and I'm always the person of my um, reputation is always way more important than one individual case um, because I am still relatively young in my career. Um, and so I'm going to do things by the book. One, because I also think that as a Black attorney, not Daniel Cameron, not a Black Republican attorney who's been mentored by Mitch McConnell, obviously, um, in a Republican state, um, but as a Black attorney, like me, especially now, being um, that I've been involved in the Breonna Taylor case, I'm still involved with the Breonna Taylor case. There's only so much I can do that they're going to let me get away with, right? And so my ethics, um, it's always going to be, um, I, I want people, when they see me, they know that I'm genuine. When, they, when I say something, I want them to know that I'm telling the truth that I'm not BSing anyone. And so um, being genuine is of utmost importance to me. Know your rules, 
uh, or your professional responsibilities, especially in your state, um, get to know people um, in those, or like in your local, I, I say it's, I, I love the National Bar Association, but you do also have to be somewhat involved on the local level as well. Um, and so it, it's, it, your reputation is one of the most important things you can have uh, in your legal career. Hold on to it, keep it sacred. Uh, be respectful to other people, you know, treat people how you want to be treated. Um, those are all the things that are important. Like I always like people are like, oh, but I'm like, I just try to pe treat people the way that I want to be treated. So, you yeah. know, it's carried me far in life so far. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any closing words, Carla? And then I have um, a few announcements. Sorry, my <laughs> computer froze for a minute. <laughs> Um, yeah, this was excellent. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to all of us today. I see Onika is already putting uh, next events in the chat, and she always does. Mm -hmm. um, we've really enjoyed this and learned so much, and it's so great to see a young lawyer in particular, and for me, a young Black woman lawyer um, at the forefront of making change in our community. So I'll turn it over I know. to you. Oh, and go you ahead. guys can't say up to 40 anymore. You got to say through 40 since yes. I just turned 40. You, this you are. So. This is, I, know, <laughs> I know you hit the 4-0 on Monday. And yeah. so we just want to let you know. So Vice President Baker is still a young lawyer. So we claim her because she is by our bylaws a young lawyer. But you are forever a young lawyer. And we want you to know that yeah. you are always welcome here at YLD. And um, for some upcoming events, if you are interested in volunteering with YLD, we are having our ambassadors program kickoff. That's tomorrow at 630. Um, this is a way to interact with young attorneys all over the country in all 12 of our regions. On February 4th, we are having a joint event on a with ABA YLD. New Year, New Connections. If you've ever been to any of our social events on Remo, you don't want to miss this. This is going to be a very big platform. There's a This is a 200 person platform, which I've never actually seen um, because it's going to be a joint event between our bar association. So please come out to that. Um, Madam President C.K. Hoffler has, will, will be giving remarks and uh, representing the National Bar Association. So come out if you've enjoyed speaking with Madam Vice President, come out on February 9th. We will be having our fourth installment of the Pathways to Bar Leadership Roadshow with NBA Vice President Henry Floyd. And our last announcement, BALSA has reached out to us. As you know, they're having their regional conventions and their national mock trial competition is looking for volunteers. We've dropped all of that information in the chat. Please let us know if there's anything that we can do for you. And thank you for coming out tonight. Have a great night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.